Hi, my name is Erin Moriarty and welcome to my channel. Just a heads up before we get into this video, I'd like to give you a bit of a trigger warning. If you have problems with discussions of medical abuse and neglect, eating issues that aren't related to an eating disorder but may be reminiscent of an eating disorder, and discussion of mental health issues including depression, anxiety, always put your own mental health first. If you think that any of these topics are likely to upset you, this probably isn't the video for you. That doesn't mean that I won't have a video in the future that you won't love. I'm also going to be talking about autism in a way that assumes some pre previous familiarity with autism, especially with how it manifests in non-men. If you're unfamiliar with that, or if you just want to learn, I really highly recommend Plumbella's video, I Am Autistic. It is a really helpful resource for how autism manifests in people who are not dudes. I have been struggling to get anything achieved. One thing I've learned through a period of self-reflection that we're about to discuss is that sometimes when I can't get the executive function together to do the thing that I need to do, it's because my brain isn't quite ready yet. And in its unready state, it spends hours thinking about potential consequences leaving me in a state where I can't proceed any further. This is a bit different than the normal executive function issues I experience with my ADHD, because normally I can just take medication and for the most part, if I am not exhausted, I will get the executive function to do the thing that I need to do. But some tasks, especially like creative tasks or personal growth tasks, I find that it's impossible for me to force my brain into doing it. It's almost like there's an obstacle in the way. Or better put it for gamers, because a lot of my audience is going to be gamers. It's like having a skill that you can't use because it's on cooldown, or maybe even better than that, games like Civilization, where you may have a skill tree and, you know, you might not be able to use this skill until you learn the earlier things in the tree. For example, I've written scripts for several videos that I thought had the potential to do really well and to capture an audience outside of my ordinary audience. I have everything I need to do those videos. The only thing that is stopping me is my brain. But when I post to my audience, I pretty much know what to expect. Uh, most people that are on my channel regularly are here for me. But people coming to my space from outside, they may be deeply disapproving of me and how I live my life just by virtue of everything that I am. I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of weeks reflecting upon why I can't make videos. And I think that my life and my understanding of myself have just changed so much since my last like major video that like even though that one was a life update, I, I feel like I have grown and changed a lot since then and I almost feel like every script that I write there's like 800 different things that I'm trying to pepper in to let people know all of the different things that I've learned about myself and grown because otherwise it's going to seem out of context to people that haven't been in my head for the past six months or so. Hell, when I look back at things that I wrote about my philosophy just a year or two ago, it's, it's almost like a totally different person. So this video is not only just a life and philosophy update that is intended to get me more comfortable with posting again, but also I hope that the things that I share in this video will help others in some way, whether it be to educate them about a lifestyle or a neurotype that's different than their own, or if it's just making a non-traditional lifestyle and neurotype more visible, because there's not that many people like me that are very visible. And there are a lot of big topics in this video that I am just going to very briefly go over. So if there's anything that you want to see me discuss in more detail, please let me know in the comments down below. Back when I was working and making content, I didn't really talk about my job very much. This was for a couple of reasons. I mean, the biggest being, obviously, I didn't want the things that I said online and my career to, you know, negatively be impacted. You never really know how something is gonna be taken. I just never wanted to be in a position where my philosophy and beliefs were very different from my bosses and it impacted my ability to have gainful employment. But anyway, I did work in IT and for a while I was a Linux support engineer and then for a while I was a technical writer and I worked on a user experience team. So uh, writing was like 25% of my job. I did just a, a lot of different things on this team and 
It really, for me, it was a dream job. It was a role that I had desired for a really long time. It was like, it was a, a job title that I felt proud of. But due to a perfect storm of me getting sicker, the pandemic, my work requirements increasing and getting more and more intense, I burned out. And unfortunately, it took me a long time to realize it because I had burned out like this before. And, or at least I had burned out in a way that was like, I don't know, it was like 20 25% as bad as what I was experiencing. But because I am prone to flares of my chronic fatigue syndrome, I just assumed that that was what it was. And I think there may be some element of that intertwined because autism, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, chronic fatigue, all of those things are all very closely intertwined in a way that doctors are really just only starting to understand. But the burnout was so bad and the symptoms were so prominent that like, it was really clearly autistic burnout because like some of the biggest problems that I was having were sensory related and um, like interpersonal communications related, not being able to, I couldn't mask anymore. I didn't even know what masking was at that point, but I was no longer able to do it. And that negatively impacted my life in a big way. The trouble was I wasn't diagnosed as autistic. Um, we've known I had ADHD ever since I was a little kid. Over the past couple of years, uh, as I've understood neurodivergency better, it was kind of like, oh, my ADHD has a lot of neurodivergent traits that are very similar to autism. But I wasn't diagnosed as autistic, so getting long-term disability in place was hard. I was able to get short-term just based on my usual medical issues, but they were basically like, well, you always had Ehlers-Danlos and you were always capable of working before, get your butt back out there, go back to work. I had a really weird financial situation because I wasn't getting any income from their disability, but I was still employed by them. So it was making it harder for me to apply for like different types of aid and such because I wasn't technically broke basically. Now at this point in time, I had a few really close autistic friends who were like the first people that ever really understood me well. And I had kind of just assumed that that was because of the overlap again between ADHD and autism. But as I needed to figure out what was wrong with me because my doctors were not helping Helping, I took a bunch of self-screening tests as honestly I, as I could. I talked to a bunch of friends that were not my therapist, but they were people who had psychiatry backgrounds who had known me for a long period of time. And as I couldn't mask in therapy anymore, my therapist started noticing that I was saying things that like only her autistic patients said. <laughs> now, unfortunately, the screening process for autism is kind of a bitch, at least in America and like the area where I am. When you're my age and you already have a CPTSD diagnosis, it is very hard for a psychologist or psychiatrist to disambiguate trauma versus ADHD versus autism. So the way that they do that is you have to go in person for hours a day, several weeks in a row. And for me, I was told that it would cost a minimum of $4,000. Now this is a problem for several reasons. First, my fatigue is so bad that I can barely leave home. Those four visits would probably be like a grand total of like 12 days of my life that were just completely gone because of that diagnostic process, which is a huge, because I would, if I wasn't there, I would be bedridden recovering from it. I was already really unwell because the disability company was just putting me through the ringer and was just using any excuse that they could to say that they were gonna deny my claim. Um, I think a lot of people think that it's a cut and dry situation once you've gotten a diagnosis where like, oh, you're disabled now, you have access to these benefits, go forth, yon person. And when in reality, everyone in every stage of the process is convinced that 90% of people that apply for benefits are faking it. And that is not remotely, <laughs> remotely true. That's a subject for another video. As a disabled person, I would say that for every confirmed faker that I have seen, I have seen hundreds of people that either did not have a diagnosis, but had very clear symptoms of a disorder. They had a diagnosis that took them five, 10, 15 years to get. So they were regarded as a faker for that period of time, or they were misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. And again, were viewed as an exaggerator or a faker for that period of time. In my experience, people are not faking it. Medical professionals and insurance companies are gaslighting them. And in this case, the the insurance company was asking me to jump through so many paperwork hoops and go through so many appointments and so many treatment options that I just could not do it. I'm tired. 
exhausted in a way that few people can process, I think, unless you similarly have gone through chronic fatigue. It's just a different type of exhaustion. Like, can I go to a doctor for an appointment? Yes. But then there is something called compensatory fatigue, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, which is basically like, if I get up to do stuff, I then need to spend at least that much time or probably two or three times that much time recovering. Can I be upright and fairly articulate for this video? Yes, but it requires the perfect storm of events with weather, weather and my medication and my energy. It is only possible for a few hours at a time and it requires an incredible amount of spiritual greenery that is not cheap to keep me propped up like this. It will cost me big time tomorrow when I am flat on my back. And here I was, losing all of the very limited energy that I had just to fight with an insurance company that was saccharine sweet on the phone, all while they casually ruined my life. Regardless of what my doctor said about myself and my illness, their nurses, who were not doctors, who did not know me, who did not know shit about my condition, they're like, nah, not disabled. They said I was fine. I could not handle being gaslit one minute longer. I quit my job. I sold my car because I realized that there was almost no chance of me driving someplace on my own anytime remotely soon. Throughout this though, I was cognizant of the fact that I only had a certain amount of money and that I have very expensive medical needs. So I needed to, I needed to somehow monetize one of my hobbies because that's the only option that I had left. The problem was even though I hadn't worked for like a year, fighting with a disability, going to all of their doctors, doing all of their appointments and all of these treatments, it was basically a full-time job. And on top of it, each of these doctors was throwing a new medication at the problem. And I was having really bad side effects from some of these medications. At the beginning of this year, I had lost so much weight from not being able to eat because medications made me horribly nauseous. And I got to the point that I was so malnourished that my stomach could really not digest anything. And none of my doctors wanted to help me with that because your weight is only a problem if you're fat in America. Like that, that, that is the doctor uh, opinion. So I basically had to sort that out on my own. And I got uh, IV nutrition through a med spa clinic. And that was, that is the only reason that I can eat solid food again, because I had to do that to myself or I had to figure that out for myself. I genuinely felt close to death at this point though. Like I hadn't been able to figure out what my problem was because I was going to all of the doctors that they wanted me to go to to prove that I was sick. I was so busy proving that I was sick that I wasn't doing anything to get better. It was not allowing me to rest or relax. When you have severe burnout, you basically need to do nothing for a fairly decent period of time, both physically and mentally. And that's hard. Like for me, initially, my inclination was to want to keep doing my podcasts and things like that. But that was a lot of mental energy that my body still wasn't prepared to give and my mind didn't have. I had fallen so behind on things, both from my depression and not having any energy, that I had a chore list miles and miles long. My room was a disaster and every time I pushed myself to try and do something about it, I would just get sick and I would have compensatory fatigue and then I would get even more behind and I just felt terrible about myself. I could not understand how I couldn't do something as basic as just cleaning my room when I didn't have a job. Like before I burned out, I had a full-time job that was demanding. I was doing four podcasts and I had a YouTube channel. Like I, for a disabled person, was doing a lot. And one consequence of that burnout is that there are skills that I can't do anymore. I don't remember the large majority of how I used to do my job because I don't know, my brain broke while I was in the middle of doing it. <laughs> I couldn't get an official autism diagnosis on paper. I wasn't able to get the treatment that I needed. At least I couldn't get access to resources that would make my life easier uh, because there's really no treatment for autism. That was when my psychiatrist kind of gave me an epiphany moment when she was like, if you got the autism diagnosis tomorrow, what would you do? And I said, you know, I'd join a support group, start talking to other people who were actually autistic and learn how my brain works and learn how to make my life work around my needs. Because when, when I initially came, found out that I had Ehlers-Danlos and my symptoms uh, started onset, it wasn't so much my doctors who were giving 
giving me the helpful advice to handle my day-to-day -day needs with my new limitations. It was the community, the community of people with EDS. So I really dove head first into the autism community. One of the reasons that I had suspected that I was autism for so long, I, that I was autistic for so long was because I watched Plumbella's videos religiously and she talks about her autism and there were things that she was saying and like, these are autism things and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny, I do those things. <laughs> so my psychiatrist said, well, why don't you just join those groups? And I found that the community, first off, knows that it is very hard to get a diagnosis and is very accepting of people who are self-diagnosed, who have put the proper time and effort and thought into it. And I think at this point in time, I have known that I was autistic for over a year now, and I started calling myself Neuro just neurodivergent instead of ADHD, uh, like about six months ago. And it, it, more recently, I've been more comfortable with calling myself autistic. And, and that was one problem with my videos is that um, it's very hard for me to be open and honest about myself without acknowledging the part of me that is autistic. And I did not feel like I could represent myself as autistic on my channel unless I had a piece of paper from a doctor that said I was autistic. But the community doesn't believe that. And in doing the things that the community has recommended to me and in doing a lot of research on my own, I'm learning how to recover from this burnout. Now, I said earlier that I didn't know that I was masking. Now, even though I didn't know that I was masking per se, I knew that talking to people outside of my immediate family, and even sometimes my family, was tiring um, because I I just sort of felt like I didn't have a personality of my own. I just sort of adapted to be the person that I needed to be for the circumstances. And that made me feel really down about myself. If I would have known that this was just autism and masking from the very beginning, this would have saved me so much heartbreak, which is why I, I tell parents, do not lie to your kids, do not try and tell them that they're not autistic or something like that, just hoping that it's going to help them fit in better or something like that, like knowing. I, I felt like an alien for most of my life, but I digress. That's another story for another, for another video. But anyway, I stopped masking a lot. Um, only when I needed to, only when I absolutely need to, and that um, really saved me a lot of energy. Also, I stopped forcing myself to endure painful sensory triggers. I've always kind of, I've, I've kind of known for a while now that I had sensory processing disorder. I just thought it was a manifestation of my ADHD. I can endure many of my sensory triggers, not all of them, but many. It comes at a cost. Doing things like just not not wearing clothes that gave me sensory triggers, because like the, I can wear whatever clothes I want, noise canceling headphones. But in addition to that, from the other side, there are sensory experiences that have a profoundly restorative impact on me. And a lot of times I try to like, oh, I'm logical, I'm above this, I don't need this, I don't want this, I don't need this ice cream that I'm craving. Da -da -da -da. Humoring that sensory seeking part of my brain has been tremendous for rejuvenation. Also, I had to realize that I I am the opposite of the the traditional perception of an autistic person who doesn't have any empathy. Uh, a lot of the autistic traits are a spectrum. Either you have none of it or you have extra of it or you're in the middle. And with regards to the empathy, I'm kind of in the extra. I overthink it to the point where I've been thinking about other people's feelings so much that I inadvertently hurt them because long story. But as a result, this makes me very good at giving advice. And I do a lot of advice giving, therapy, emotional labor. I know that's not the, the accurate term for this, but it's, it's basically emotional labor um, in this circumstance. My autism makes it hard for me to enforce boundaries with people that I'm friends with and I really need them to communicate with me in a specific way or I will be taken advantage of. I will devote all of my energy towards their emotional needs and I will have nothing left. I'm trimming down my social circle to primarily associate with people that have similar communication styles that I don't have to mask around. That has been huge. Miscommunication and being misunderstood is a huge frustration that a lot of autistic people have, especially with dealing with uh, neurotypical people or just people with different neurotypes. And I think because I'm AFAB in a lot of situations, especially at work, I was expected to be the one who changed my communication style if I was in a scenario where my communication style didn't match the person that I was speaking to. And that is a lot of effort that other people put me through that I'm not gonna go through anymore. Uh, if your communication style doesn't match mine, maybe we're just not friends that talk a lot. And that's not a bad thing. And if not, these people have to at least meet me halfway, if not come 
come to where I am. The expectation in communication is always that the autistic person is going to be more neurotypical, and I don't understand why that is. Uh, even amongst neurotypical people, people have different communications preferences. People should just be discussing those type of things. There were many, many other things that helped to uh, probably enough that I could do an entire video just from recovering from autistic burnout. But I think one of the biggest recent things was seeing Plumbella's video on autism. Often in my life, if I couldn't see something, I didn't really believe it was possible. And I didn't need to like see it per se, but like read about somebody doing it or, you know, hear about somebody doing it. I didn't see a lot of people on the internet openly talking about being autistic unless autism or neurodivergency is the center focus of their content. Seeing her videos, seeing her talk openly about every facet of her autism, including the negative part, has been extremely important to me, both from a, hey, other people are doing this, you can do this perspective, but also a, there are probably other people out there whose brains work like mine do, and seeing me as a disabled person talking about my life and the way that I get things done in the way that I survive, that may be profoundly beneficial to somebody. A lot of times I get wrapped up in this, oh, what do I have to offer the internet that no one else has to offer? And I think one of the things that I do have to offer is my ability to separate my shame from actions that I've taken in the past and from things that have happened. And I don't have the pressure to socially conform and the fear of being socially ostracized because I've always felt kind of like an alien, then I was in the wrong species. I realize now that a big reason that I've been so hesitant to release videos is because myself and my worldview have changed so drastically in the past few months that I keep having to add different amendments and side notes and things like that. I, I always feel that there's this need to explain all of the myriad ways that my brain is different and that I understand myself differently so my videos make sense. And that's making it really difficult for me to script. I also felt that there was no way that I would be supportive if I was fully open and honest about who I am, everything, even the, you know, ugly and messy and dirty parts. Hi, my name is Erin Moriarty. I'm autistic, I'm disabled, and I'm gender fluid. And I'm not gonna let people make me ashamed of those things anymore. I'm gonna be really experimenting with content as I continue to figure out who I am, what my priorities are, what is me, and what we're masks. So I really appreciate your patience, and I really appreciate your watching. I hope that you continue along this journey with me. If you do want to do so, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It really does help out my channel a lot. And have a wonderful day. Alright, hopefully everything kept working till the end. If it'll leave you breathless or with a nasty score of a long list of ex-lovers, they'll tell you I'm insane. Cause you know I love the player, but you are love of the game.